Hello folks and welcome to today's webinar, Profiting with Compost and the Importance of Compost Quality with Dr. Greg Vanilo and Jane Merner Senecal. This is the fifth of six webinars in the on-farm composting and compost use webinar series. I'm Linda Bilson Sprolis of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative, and I'll be your facilitator for today. A quick shout out to a couple of my ILSR colleagues who are helping with this series. Sophia Jones will be providing technical support throughout the webinar, and Clarissa Libertelli is a talented artist who's creating beautiful artwork for our composting initiative, including this graphic that you see here. Thank you both. Um, for those not familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and to protect the climate. Our focus is to catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales. You can find out more about our work and peruse our wealth of resources, including reports, infographics, webinars, podcasts, a policy library, and policy map on our website. If you go to ilsr.org forward slash composting, you'll see a composting resources drop down menu on the right hand side of the screen. And there you can select whatever you would like. This webinar series is being brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, of which ILSR is a founding member. The Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project that is supporting farmers in implementing healthy soils practices and regenerative agriculture on 1 million acres of farmland in Maryland and the Chesapeake region by 2030. Uh, so the first three webinars in the on-farm composting and compost use series focused on best management practices for creating high quality co uh, compost including setting up a composting system on your farm, integrating composting into your farming operation, and developing composting recipes. The final three webinars are focused on the, on the broader benefits of compost and what to do with it once you have it. Last time we looked at the benefits to the climate and specific soil and plant benefits of compost made with particular feedstocks. Today, we'll be uh, discussing how to assess compost quality and how the production of good compost can benefit your farming business. The final webinar in the series will be on December 7th and will feature Dr. Will Brinton of Woods End Laboratories. Dr. Brinton is the founder and chief science officer of Woods End Labs. He's the inventor of the Solvita compost and soil health tests, and he's been helping to advance compost and soil health testing for decades. His webinar will cover the role compost plays in nutrient cycling on farms to the benefit of soil, plants, and water quality. You can re register for that session on our website, and you can also still register for past webinars to access their recordings. Now let's get to know each other with a few interactive polls. So we will start with, where are you participating from? Northeastern US, Southern US, Midwestern US, Western US, or outside of US? We're always excited to see uh, the folks from outside of the U.S., but realize that this is not exactly their time zone. So I'll give folks just a couple more seconds. All right. So we've got some good representation from the Midwest today and the Northeast, a little bit from the Southern and Western U.S., and even a couple people from outside of the U.S. Welcome, everyone. Next question. Are you currently composting? Yes, already composting. No, but interested. Uh, no, but interested in supporting others in composting or something other. And if you select other, uh, it'd be great to know in the chat uh, or in your questions box, you can communicate with us what that means. All right, let's see the results. So yes, vast majority already composting, awesome. Um, and the folks that aren't yet, hopefully we'll be providing you some good resources for getting started and other. Again, um, if you're able, enter, just let us know what that means. All right, final question. What best describes your affiliation? Select one of the following, farmer, composter, farm service provider, and then a really big category, researcher, government, or nonprofit. And the other option is other business or other. Um, and we know that you all filled this stuff out uh, when you registered for the webinar, but just so you all can see who else is on uh, the webinar today. So just another couple seconds. 
All right. Good, healthy third of you are farmers. Welcome. Um, good representation from composters, uh, research government, and nonprofit, and other. Um, thank you all uh, for joining us. And let's go back to our presentation for today. So, um, just before we get started, um, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, you will have noticed that everyone is in listen only mode. Uh, we will be taking some questions at the end of each pre uh, speaker's presentation. Um, you can enter your questions as they come up in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel box, and we will uh, screen them. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and a copy will be sent to you uh, after the event. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Dr. Greg Ivanilo, our first presenter. Um, Dr. Greg Ivanilo is a professor in the School of Plant and Environmental Sciences at Virginia Tech University. His research uh, has addressed the effects of compost byproducts on plant, soil, water, and air quality, and he is a composting and compost use educator. So without further ado, take it away, Greg. Great, Linda. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction and the invitation to speak today about uh, a subject near and dear to my heart, which is compost testing, which is very critical once one has gone through the process of making the compost. So a few uh, introductory questions to ask for someone who might be considering compost testing is why in fact test your compost? So one of the reasons might be to assess the process. So as you are actually producing the compost, turning the compost, aerating it, doing everything you need to do to produce a high quality material, uh, you may occasionally take a sample just to learn how the process is proceeding. A second reason would be a regulatory requirement. This may not be important so much for a farmer who may be using his or her compost on site, but if anyone markets their compost or if someone is to purchase compost, uh, regulations require it for environmental health and safety reasons. And then a third reason is that customers want and or need the results. And those customers can even be the farmer composters who are generating it and using it on farm. Uh, knowing uh, the results of the compost can help to avoid problems in its use. And, they, and for someone marketing the compost uh, in soil blends or bioretention cell media, some other sort of media other than direct application, it's important to uh, help understand if it would help meet specifications established by regulations. So it's important to know, first off, that a compost that may be good for one use may not necessarily be good for another. So that means that compost quality should be defined by its intended use and never has one meaning across all types of composts or across compost use for various uh, uh, uses. So let's start off uh, with the pile that uh, from which the compost will be gathered. Uh, and I've got an illustration here of two such uh, piles that one might sample in order to have their compost uh, tested. The top one labeled A is a sampling in a well-mixed pile. This could be a pile that has uh, is near the end of composting and uh, may be soon marketed or used by uh, the uh, by a farmer or someone purchasing the compost. And in this case, uh, one simply takes random samples uh, across the entire windrow, uh, and in this case, five to ten different spots. Uh, collects these samples in a bucket. Uh, composites them, mixes well, and then uh, probably places them in some sort of a Ziploc bag. Uh, you can add ice packs into a shipping container and ship to a lab. 
So it's important not actually to freeze the sample, but to keep it cool because some of the analyses that will be performed uh, or some of the parameters on which analyses are performed can change if the sample actually heats during the shipping process and in sitting in the lab waiting to be analyzed. Uh, the second lower part of the illustration, labeled B, is uh, sampling possibly during uh, assessing what's going on in a pile that's not yet completely well mixed and probably not uh, also uh, near completion. And uh, one might sample here because of uh, uh, measured parameters that might indicate the composting isn't going well. For example, if the, the temperature isn't rising or the temperature falls precipitously at a point that one expects it to be rising, uh, it might be important to take a sample and have it analyzed to help um, determine what a possible problem is. In this case, since the piles may not be well mixed or are not well mixed in this example, uh, you'd want to cut into the pile at various places and take samples um, at various locations uh, in the edge of an open face in which the pile has been cut into. Again, these samples should then be composited and mixed well. And as in the first example, place in a Ziploc bag of some sort uh, and uh, ship them with ice packs. So then these uh, samples will uh, be received at a laboratory. At some other point, I'll mention some of the analyses that uh, some farmers can actually do on their farm without shipping away. But to have a complete analysis, particularly early on in the process when you're first developing your composting process, uh, it's uh, desirable to send them to a uh, reputable lab so that you can uh, learn a, a variety of uh, parameters and how they're doing. So compost quality standards have largely been developed by the compost industry. And in the United States, the U.S. Composting Council, and I have the URL here for that organization, is the largest trade organization dealing with composting. In fact, it's one of the most, uh, one of the largest and most reputable composting trade organizations in the world. And there are two programs that the U.S. Composting Council, uh, through its membership, which includes uh, composters, and academics and research, including researchers and educators, uh, two programs that have been developed for use to help assess and market uh, compost uh, based on its quality. The first program is a testing program uh, and it is been, it's uh, largely performed by laboratories that have been certified to conduct tests for this test method shown here, which is the test methods for the examination of composting and compost, or the TMEC. And it's a laboratory manual that has been developed by composters and, and, uh, and researchers throughout the country more than 20 years ago, and has been adopted by special composting labs that have been certified throughout the United States. A list of these labs can be found at the U.S. Composting Council website. There are other labs that do perform some important analyses that are that are uh, good to know uh, for your compost. But some of these other labs, uh, and these are often agricultural labs that might analyze soils and they might analyze animal manures, they often do not perform all of the analyses that are important for compost. A second program developed by the U.S. Composting Council is that of the Seal of Testing Assurance, or STA. And anyone, any composter who's generated compost uh, for marketing can, in fact, have their material tested and then receive a seal of testing assurance, which demonstrates that they have had their compost tested. Now, it doesn't provide an indication of the quality of that compost, um, 
because as I mentioned earlier, compost qualities can vary depending on their use, but it does indicate that the compost has been tested by one of these certified laboratories. Let's look now at some of the types of parameters that are measured through this U.S. Composting Council program, the Seal of Testing Assurance. And these, again, are parameters whose uh, methods of analysis are specified in the TMEC. Uh, as with some of the other ag testing labs, uh, compost parameters include plant nutrients, and we see here the most common ones such as nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, magnesium. Uh, it will also perform uh, micronutrient analysis. So the compost technical data sheet will show um, how, uh, in what form that these nutrients are, uh, have, are, are being expressed. And they'll express the results both on an as-is or a wet weight basis and on a dry weight basis. Some of the other um, parameters that I'll address a little later include moisture content, the amount of organic matter in the compost, the pH of the compost, um, an indicator of the soluble salts in the compost. I'll explain why that's important. And it's usually expressed in electrical conductivity in decisiemens per meter or millimoles per centimeter. Uh, particle size also, uh, which is a screen size, a uh, certain percentage passing a screen size of a certain uh, diameter. Now, some of the indicators for quality compost that are not typically performed by normal agricultural testing labs include that of stability and what is off is called maturity. Stability uh, is an indicator is indicated by how much carbon dioxide is still being released uh, by a uh, an act of uh, compost, or it can be the amount of oxygen that's being assimilated uh, by the act of compost. Maturity is more of an indicator of the fitness for use or potential for phytotoxicity of the compost, and it uh, can be measured by uh, germ germination, emergence of uh, various chemicals. Um, finally, uh, the amount, the pathogens and trace metals, as determined by a couple EPA tests, uh, are also shown as passing or failing on this uh, technical data sheet. These technical data sheets will also provide uh, information for how the product can be used for a variety of purposes, lawns, flower beds, uh, growing mixes, topsoil, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. And it also indicates what the ingredients were that for this compost. And in this case, the compost was a combination of yard trimmings and food byproducts. So let's look at some of the uh, indicators or the parameters of uh, high quality compost. Uh, and we'll mention uh, what typical values are and what preferred values are. Uh, pH is very important. Composting tends to be a neutralizing compo uh, process. So if your composting feedstock starts off at a high pH, it tends to lower during the composting process. And if it starts off somewhat acid, it tends to rise. So uh, preferred uh, composting, comp post finished pH is somewhere around neutral, six to seven and a half. It can be uh, wider than that. Uh, and we often see them as low as five and as high as 8.5, but we prefer them being near neutral. I mentioned soluble salts and they are uh, generally expressed in terms of electrical conductivity, this measurement being decisiemens per meter. There's a wide range of soluble salts that can occur in compost. In this, uh, in this example, we shows about uh, one to 10 decisiemens per meter. Soluble salts are important because they are uh, the indicator of uh, 
anions and cations that are plant nutrients and are available for plant uptake. However, too high a concentration of soluble salts can impede germination, maybe cause some seedling death. So we like to see soluble salt uh, as expressed as electrical conductivity in compost being less than about four decisiemens per meter. Uh, organic matter we know is one of the most important uh, values of compost. And so we like to see it typically over 50%, although 30 to 70% is common. I have two indicators of uh, moisture in the material. Uh, one is water holding capacity. So this is how much water a compost can actually hold acting as a sponge. And we know particularly in sandy soils, uh, compost can be applied uh, to help hold water in the soil for plant growth. And we'd like to see it hold at least its weight in water, which is 100%. Moisture content is the content of moisture in the material uh, as is, that's either purchased or when it's finished. Uh, typically, we like to see it somewhere around 40 to 50%, uh, but we can have a much higher moisture, as high as uh, 70%, and this is an indicator that uh, uh, maybe during the process, there was too much water in that material and uh, it was blocking pore space. And so we don't like, we don't really want to see moisture higher than 50% in a material that you're purchasing. In addition, that means you're if you purchase it by, the, uh, by mass, you're paying for water weight instead of uh, the weight of the compost. And then bulk density is an indicator of the, the weight per volume of the material. Typically, it's somewhere around 800 to 1,000 uh, pounds per cubic yard. And some of this is going to depend on the moisture content of the compost also. Let's look at a few other uh, uh, compost property values. Uh, nutrients. So we know that a value of compost is the organic matter that it provided in whatever use, whether it's provided to the soil or in a mix uh, with potting media or bioretention cell media. But uh, nutrients and their value is important. But good compost, high quality compost, isn't determined by a specific uh, concentration of nutrients. Um, unlike commercial fertilizers or manures, uh, higher the nutrient content doesn't necessarily mean that you have a, a better quality compost. But it is important to know what the concentrations are. So it helps one understand how one is supplementing the plant available nutrients that may be in the soil to begin with. Two of the nutrients that are very important uh, and not necessarily uh, from only a from a plant uh, need point of view, but from an environmental point of view, are nitrogen and phosphorus. These two nutrients, while they are essential plant nutrients, are also two nutrients that can provide or or cause some uh, groundwater or surface water quality uh, uh, problems, uh, particularly phosphorus. So. Phosphorus is harder to control in compost, the concentration of phosphorus that is, particularly compost that are created from animal manures. So when one is applying large amounts of compost uh, in tons per acre or supplying it to provide a significant amount of nitrogen, we often see a large amount of phosphorus, much greater than what's needed by the plants applied to the soil. And in many states, particularly in urban landscapes uh, for uh, lawns and uh, other urban landscapes, there are some limitations being imposed on the use of compost because of the potential for runoff of excess phosphorus. That's about all I'll say about that in this presentation, uh, but a later presentation by Will Brinton will address the phosphorus issue to much greater extent. Uh, now moving down the list, particle size is important. The smaller particles have more surface area and are more bioreactive, uh, and, and 
compost with smaller particle size is usually considered more uh, bio bioreactive in the soil. Uh, trace elements, uh, which are mostly heavy metals, are um, are generally uh, regulated by an EPA rule that was designed for heavy metals in biosolids. This is the EPA Part 503 rule. Uh, there are no federal rules for uh, trace elements or heavy metals in compost, but most state governments that that regulate or oversee compost use have adopted these federal biosolids regulations for heavy metal concentrations. And then uh, maturity, uh, we want to ensure that the compost is stable and not phytotoxic, and there are measurements for this. And then lastly, pathogens, uh, and they're indicated by the presence of fecal coliforms and salmonella and must be non-detectable because compost is a composting is a sanitizing process which kills uh, pathogens, both not just animal pathogens, but plant pathogens. And then the beneficial uh, microorganisms in the, in the uh, compost can also compete with uh, the, uh, these sort of uh, uh, pa plant pathogens and, and animal pathogens. So let's look at a couple uh, indicators of compost maturity that are very specific to compost as compared to uh, manure or other organic materials. And those are, as I mentioned earlier, stability, which is the degree of decomposition of energy containing feedstocks. So we know that during the composting process, microbes use the carbon in the feedstocks for food, for their energy. And in doing so, they, uh, they, cre they create new bug bodies and then stabilize that material in their own bodies. Uh, and the other indicator of compost maturity uh, is fitness for use, which can be due to phytotoxicity. Immature compost can be phytotoxic due to such constituents as free ammonia and or volatile organic acids. Here's an indicate uh, or a uh, illustration of uh, some phytotoxicity that has occurred when some compost has been used in the landscape around these, these uh, plants. The compost has not been adequately stabilized, and one of the uh, products of an unstabilized compost, which is acetic acid or vinegar, has wafted out into the lawn and caused some bleaching here. This type of acetic acid can also uh, be harmful to germinating seeds and uh, young seedlings uh, if the compost is not fully mature. So what are the differences between a mature and a non-mature compost? So in a mature compost, there's no continued decomposition. In immature, there is further decomposition. Mature has an earthy smell where immature may be malodorous due to anaerobic conditions. There's no toxicity potential in a mature, but high toxicity potential in an immature. And in a mature, there's no impact on available soil nitrogen, meaning there will be some soil nitrogen or some nitrogen made available from the mineralizing compost. But in an immature material, you can actually get a tie up or immobilization of uh, soil nitrogen from an immature compost. There are a number of tests for compost maturity. Uh, these are for stability. Respirometry tests are those that determine how much oxygen is being taken up by a by an immature compost or a non or a mature compost. Uh, oxygen uh, taken up or carbon dioxide given off during the process. And then there's two um, non-lab methods: a self-heating flat. Uh, uh, test and a Solvita carbon dioxide uh, indicator, which are also indicators of stability. For phytotoxicity, there are some lab analyses of ammonium, uh, volatile fatty acids, but the most comprehensive indicators of phytotoxicity can be those of biological assays that is growing plants in some of the compost and comparing it to a control to determine if there's uh, 
uh, you're having good emergence and seedling vigor from the compost that you intend to use. Here's some methods assessing stability. This is a respirometer in which compost is placed in here in the lab. And then the amount of CO2 that's given evolved or the amount of oxygen that's taken up in the breakdown of that organic matter gives an indicator of whether that compost is, is stable or not. And this self-heating flask is an insulated flask into which one places a compost product uh, that one is not sure of its stability. And if the material heats up largely in this flask, it's an indicator that the compost is not yet stable. There should be very little heating if the material is already stable. Uh, this shows how carbon dioxide evolution is related to stability. Um, these dots uh, indicate uh, a different uh, CO2 that has evolved from composts of different age. And we see that uh, compost that's 10 weeks to 40 weeks in age evolve very little CO2, but immature earlier compost gives off a lot of CO2. And it's this type of a uh, relationship that enables one to determine from respiration whether or not compost is stable or not. Here's uh, the Solvita quick test that was developed by Woods End. And we can uh, measure two methods of maturity, CO2 that's evolved and ammonia that's evolved uh, by placing compost in these jars, which are sealed. And the jars contain some paddles, uh, which, which have a um, uh, substance on them that, that absorbs CO2 or ammonia and then changes color. And the degree of color change indicates whether there's been a large or small amount of either CO2 or ammonia that has been given off. And one can then tell the, the degree of uh, maturity based on the color change. Let's look at some of the bioassay studies. Um, one is the Crest seed test that's been approved by many composting organizations. It's one of the most widely recognized plant species for compost bioassays. It's moderately sensitive to salinity and it's insensitive to in a class of herbicides known as auxinic. And this is how the process would work uh, in one compartment. Uh, we grow these uh, crest seeds uh, with a control that we know produces a fine product. And then the other, we grow the seeds with the compost. And in this case, this compost has resulted in some uh, retardation of the growth of the seeds, indicating that the compost is not quite as high quality as it should be. Uh, we can also use a top growth study to determine the rate of compost that we may want to add to soil. In this case, a control containing no compost and then uh, soil containing 20, 40, 80, and 100% compost uh, were placed into these pots and then a bean seeds were grown and the top growth was measured. And we could see that early on, uh, up to 20% incorporation of the compost, uh, there was a, a good growth and then the growth began to be reduced. This compost had a high electrical conductivity of eight decisiemens per meter, which meant that higher additions resulted in the high salt content and interfered with the growth of the plant. So such a bioassay might help one to determine the uh, uh, incorporation rate one might use with their compost. Another type uh, similar study uses a root growth indicator. In this case, 0, 25, 50, and 100% of municipal solid waste compost uh, were placed into pots in, to which sorghum sudan grass was grown during a 21-day trial. And again, we can see the root growth declining as we go from 25 to 100% compost. And this is due to root inhibition from a moderately immature compost that had a high volatile fat um, fatty acid content um, 
And so again, it provides a, an indication of a good mix of compost in the pots. Uh, another problem, potential problem for compost quality are herbicide residues. About 20 years ago, uh, in, in broadleaf weeds uh, throughout the U.S., this was first noticed in Spokane, Washington, at an experiment station at Washington State, and at Penn State University, vegetable plants uh, grown in soils treated with compost began failing. Uh, it, was the, it was traced to compost that was produced from both yard waste trimmings, livestock manure, and bedding. And it, in the, 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 the uh, cause of these problems were two herbicides known as in the class of pyr pyridine carboxylic acids. Uh, one is clopyrrolid and one is picloram. Clopyrrolid is largely a turf grass herbicide. Picloram, a... a, a um, uh, hay and uh, grassland herbicide. Uh, both of these mimic plant growth regulators, such as auxins. They're very water soluble. The composting process will actually degrade these, but because they act as plant growth regulators, they are phytotoxic at very low concentrations. In fact, uh, they, not just less than 10 parts per billion, but some plants are affected by concentrations as low as four parts per billion. So these uh, certain feedstock containing these, such as uh, hay, which has been treated with picloram or turf grass, which has been treated with clopyrrolid, even manures of animals uh, excreted that had just fed on the hay have had been and then composted have been shown to have higher concentrate high enough concentrations of uh, the picloram in them to cause the uh, the problem. So it's extremely important to ensure that you know the source of your feedstock for your compost. And these materials are broadleaf herbicides. Uh, they don't affect grasses, but they affect a multitude of broadleaf plants. So there are some herbicide residue bioassays that can be performed. And here we see some leaf curl that's uh, typical of these sort of herbicides uh, in a clover. At, uh, and it's shown, these are at very low herbicide levels. Uh, compost quality particularly if you're marketing the material, is also influenced by the presence of inert contaminants, such as metal, glass, or plastic fragments. Metals and glass have the potential for both physical injury and the sources can be trash or demolition materials. Plastics have an aesthetic potential problem, and uh, we know that there's some problems with microplastics. And typically, we want to see the total of metal, glass, and plastic in compost be less than 1% by weight. Uh, finally, I mentioned the, uh, the trace elements, most of these, which are heavy metals. The 503 limits in parts per million are listed for each of these metals. And these are uh, the averages of, of uh, over 3,600 samples that were analyzed by the Soil Control Lab, which is a certified composting lab in California. And the averages of these uh, uh, metals and trace elements are, are orders of magnitude typically below uh, what has been deemed acceptable by these 503 regulations. So in summary, compost testing is uh, necessary to assess the process to meet regulatory requirements and provide information for customers, especially for meeting specifications. Sampling and testing protocols have been developed by the composting industry, and the testing parameters include biological, chemical, and physical properties. And with that, I will end and um, per perhaps go to uh, any questions, if there are uh, any questions I can answer. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, we do have some questions, some of which I think you may have answered, but maybe just to be sure, could you uh, provide a definition for phytotoxicity? Oh, yeah, sorry, I glossed over that. So phyto means plant, toxicity means 
killing, so it's some substance that's killing. So a phytotoxicity would be an injury to a plant, which can be caused by things like salts or heavy metals or herbicides. Great, thank you. Um, and that image you showed uh, of the phytotoxicity in action, I think was really helpful too. Um, there was a question about, I think you, you touched on microplastics and you touched on herbicides. I didn't catch if you touched on pharmaceuticals, but the question I think is more about STA certifi certified uh, labs versus other certifications and uh, whether there's a difference um, in what they test. Mm -hmm. And I guess pharmaceuticals, if you didn't touch on that. Right. So, uh, so there is a tremendous number of parameters that are tested uh, during the STA process. Um, larger than is typically tested for by um, agricultural labs. And again, they, they include elements uh, such as the nutrients and micronutrients, macronutrients and micronutrients and salts and pH and physical properties such as particle size, water holding capacity. Uh, one uh, to know to learn everything that's tested in the STA, uh, I would recommend you go to the U.S. Composting Council website, and there's a, a good description of the STA program and the variety of what's tested. They they also have there the labs that do the testing and the uh, and the variety of uh, parameters that are tested in uh, the TMEC. So um, what what wasn't, uh, um, and, and I'm not sure if this is part of the questions, but you did mention early on during this question, um, Linda, about uh, pharmaceuticals. And um, typically these will not be tested in the, uh, in, during the, the TMEC, but, um, but they, they could be a source of uh, some potential problems. Typically, um, pharmaceuticals are well degraded in a compost system. In fact, most herbicides are. The only herbicides that have been shown to pose that problem of having uh, some phytotoxicity are those pyridine carboxylic acids. So while they are decomposed, they are so bioactive at such low concentrations that they can still pose a problem. Um, if one is concerned about pharmaceuticals, say from what you, in manure, uh, you might have to go to a specialty lab, but in, in which case it could be very expensive because you have to know which pharmaceuticals you're looking for. There's no black box type of an analytical procedure that will that will test for a variety of pharmaceuticals without specifically stating it. Plus, there's a much more complex system for how one samples the, the kinds of containers that one places the compost in, and and the uh, and 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 this and the sampling container that will get delivered to a specialty lab, because many of the types of pharmaceuticals uh, can be mirrored or disguised by, say, some of the plastics in plastic bags and plastic containers. So you, you um, I, so typically people, composters don't generally have these tested unless there's some indicator that uh, there's been some kind of a, um, a contamination. Great. And on the topic of plastics, we're definitely getting a lot of questions about PFAS and just mm -hmm. whether it's inevitable that composts will all contain some level of microplastic in them. Do you have any feedback yeah. on that? Okay, so so you mentioned two different things. You mentioned microplastics, and I think you mentioned PFAS, which are become which have become like the um, the constituent du jour uh, because of uh, the concentrations of them that have been found on uh, certain types of land, largely military land that's been found, uh, that's been treated with uh, firefighting foams. 
So let, let me first mention microplastics. So I, I think we live in a world that has that has microplastics everywhere. It's in our soils, it's in it's gonna be in our compost, in our I don't know that there's a way of actually avoiding microplastics in our environment. Uh, it's either already there, uh, it's you know, or, or or it's going to be added there in something that we add to our soil. Uh, PFAS, uh, PFAS are a, uh, uh, for those who aren't familiar with them, are a number of different chemicals, uh, which are often called forever chemicals. These were developed back in the 1950s. They're used in uh, so many different products. They were used in Teflon coatings and they're used in in many other different coatings and uh, in firefighting foams. And uh, they're, they've uh, been discovered in, uh, in groundwater in New England. Um, and there is actually a, um, a, a New England um, uh, uh, f uh, composting facility that uh, was forced to stop selling their compost because of uh, higher concentrations of uh, PFAS chem chemicals in their material. Um, in general, I will say that um, the, the the concentrations through the risk assessments that have been done has shown that the concentrations in most compost in compost products uh, should not elicit concern, but it's important to know the source of the compost to know whether or not there's there's potential. Uh, just about every composter in the country is looking at their feedstocks and trying to determine whether some potential exists for contamination with these. Uh, they've been linked to, um, to some of the processes that take place in the uh, paper pulping industry, so some higher concentrations uh, occur then, but what we find these chemicals everywhere. We find them in food wastes. Uh, unfortunately, we have, um, we have added many chemicals uh, to our, you know, daily surroundings uh, uh, because of the 60 or 70 year history after World War II of uh, organic chemical production and use in many. Uh, so without trying to create too much worry about compost, because I don't know that compost is any more of a, of a concern and a fear than anything else in our daily life, uh, just know that uh, these materials are going to be uh, ever present and uh, and anything that's considered a uh, process that's considered to be organic, and I'm using organic in the FDA sense of not using uh, chemicals of concern, fertilizers, uh, is probably still going to have some level of contamination just due to the history of how we've done things for the last 60 and 70 years. Sorry. Well, that's <laughs> That's a sobering note to, to end things, uh, end this current segment on. But thank you, Greg, uh, for your presentation and for answering those questions. At this point, I'm going to switch things over and introduce our next presenter. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jane Merner Senecal, who owns and operates Earth Care Farm in Rhode Island, which was started by her father in 1977. Uh, with the help of three generations of miners and a small dedicated staff, the farm raises produce and cattle, but is most well known for its Myrner's Gold Compost. As the first and largest composter in the state, the farm transforms many hundreds of tons of materials per year into rich compost for gardens across New England. So welcome, Jane. Take it away. We can't hear you. You might need to unmute. <laughs> Can everybody hear me now? <laughs> yes, sounds great. Ooh, all right, so I'm a composter farmer. I'm not super techie. Sorry about that. Um, I felt like, thank you so much, Linda, for that really nice introduction. And almost more important than introducing my family and me is our compost. So I'm going to try to show it here. So here is a high quality compost. This is what you're wanting to see. This is what I want you 
third of the people watching, you farmers that want to make lots of compost for your farms, make this beautiful black gold. So a, one of the easiest ways to assess this high a high quality compost, if you're just making this for yourselves, for your farms, is by the color. Um, it should be nice and dark and black. There's so much you can tell by just sensing and feeling the compost. So the color, the texture, it's got this beautiful crumb structure. So it's mostly coffee ground like, but there are these little aggregates that are so great and filled with, I'm gonna get this on my computer, um, these beautiful pores that uh, microbes are gonna find. They're just a habitat that they can thrive in. Um, the other thing is use your nose. So um, uh, Dr. Evangelo talked about this earlier, but it smells amazing. This smells like, should smell like, when you walk your field after a little rain and you get that loamy smell, just earth. It's got a name, geosmin. I love that so much. It's very like a relaxing smell. There is actually a little oxytocin apparently that uh, is released when you smell that odor. Um, so anti anti stressing. <laughs> it's a good thing I'm doing it right now. Um, so and then so color and then just know one thing. My dad always told me when I was growing up is in one handful of our compost there's more microorganisms and life forms than there are humans on the planet and that just really you just end up having so much respect and this, there's a universe in here that we're caring for and um that's the quality that you want you want to be putting those life forms into your fields and production so i'm going to share my screen now so i can show some slides and here we go <laughs> All right, so this is my dad I'm talking about. So before I was born even, he found the largest, cheapest piece of land that he could find here in Rhode Island and um, wanted to homestead. He was a back to the land movement uh, follower, like a lot of Europeans and Americans in, back in the 70s. And uh, what he found when he put his feet on on his land and put his hands in was, he had really poor quality soil for growing the produce he was wanting to grow. Um, so it, we had less than 1% organic matter in our fields and a pH of around five, which makes it very challenging to grow produce. So he just dedicated himself. He was committed to organic practices. That was the mindset of the 60s and 70s, what he was coming from, that whole social background. He was really into the earth. Um, and making it better. So he cover cropped, but that was a slow process of building organic matter, very helpful, but slow. And then he realized making compost was gonna speed things up a lot. So he, at first we were just making compost from the farm. I was actually still not born yet. He was collecting you know, leaves. We are in New England where we get a beautiful resource of leaves that fall onto the ground every autumn. Um, wood chips from when, whenever we had storms or clearing fields, there, he would chip up branches, our own animal manures and bedding, our own food scraps and, um, you know, field uh, produce, you know, leftover pumpkins and things. Um, and then that you start to realize as you're a farmer, man, it takes so much material. It just, it, you end, you have this big pile to start with. And then once it's finished, you end up with like a yard of compost. You need so much. So he started going out and collecting more materials, collecting from other horse farms, cattle farms, going to, we're in Rhode Island with a plethora of marine resources. So he'd collect seaweed and um, go to the docks and get fish scraps. And then we had a relationship with our local zoo, getting manure and bedding brought in. And it got larger and larger. So by the time I came around, um, by the time I'm 10 years old or so, we have everything being brought to the farm. He no longer has to go out and get it. He's got great relationships with a lot of local businesses and we're currently very large scale. And I was very blessed to get to take over at this stage where he's got all these systems worked out. Here's our farm today. Um, I'm speaking to you right here from this farmhouse. It's really, a beneficial thing to live in the middle of your compost site. I know it seems funny, but um, I can keep such a good eye on things. Um, being right here, looking out, I can actually look out right now. There's a landscaper dumping some wood chips as we speak, and um, <laughs> I can sort of police everything from here. Control station. Um, we do have quite a bit of farm fields too. We grow 
garlic, rhubarb, asparagus, strawberries, kind of at a large scale, and then a plethora of other herbs and veggies um, as well. A great way to test our own crops. Uh, and then we have this, it's about three acres of compost production area. Um, you'll notice for those compost producers out there or farms, you know, looking to get into this, this kind of grayish, beigeish area, that's all gravel that we've brought in to create a compost pad to put to put our compost area on so that we can engineer um, where the rainwater flows. That's something to really keep in mind when you're setting up your, your compost facility. Our compost facility was set up before there was regulations, and then we worked with the state to develop good regulations so that other composters could follow things we learned along the way. Um, but all the rainwater, um, just from berms and swales made with our own machinery, is it flows down here off all the compost into, we have two retention ponds, one here, one that's blocked by this tree. Um, so anything nitrogen rich is going to flow into these ponds. Um, and then those ponds, we have, a, a great thing going on, we have nine acres, I'm gonna kind of outline it here, of pasture grass. There's also a huge pasture back here where we can, um, we have cattle and we can pump this water if, if needed um, onto our pastures. Um, we don't pump it onto our, our crop fields. Um, we do pump it onto our pastures or if needed, if the compost is dry, we can put it back onto the compost. Uh, we're in Rhode Island where we get about 50 inches of rain a year, so we're pretty blessed with a good consistent source of rain here, and for the most part, it's changing. Um, but that has been, it's a, it's a nice little closed loop system. And you'll notice, so this is early spring when this picture was taken, the leaves haven't even come out yet, these are just buds on the trees. And you can see how vibrantly green our fields are, our produce is always the first to pop out of the ground. Um, in the spring before our neighboring farms. And um, just, it's it, it's a nice system. And now our fields, I mean, I can't even imagine what my dad was dealing with back with less than 1% organic matter. Now I've got 12% organic matter in this field. It, it's just so easy to grow in. So um, our guiding principle here at the farm for our fields and our compost production is to think like a microbe. Microbes, they need oxygen, they need to breathe. We just treat them just like they're a being, just like we are. So avoiding compaction in your fields and in your compost in particular is going to be key. You want to be able to have those air pockets in there for them to breathe. Um, keep th So that means if you're, we find it takes three weeks to a, to a month before those microorganisms sort of, they, they're breaking everything down so quickly, metabolizing things, the, the space in the pores gets reduced, so then it's time to flip after about three to four weeks. Keep that aerated. Um, we're pretty much flipping every batch three to four, every three to four weeks. And the mi microbes need food. Um, we have found, just from messing around over the last 40 years, that the wider range of inputs you're putting in, you know, feedstocks we're adding to the compost, the better our compost is, your, it, it kind of attracts different microorganisms if you have lots of different feedstocks rather than just yard materials. We have yard materials, but we have animal manures and fish scraps and coffee grounds and cranberry um, matter and um, all sorts of brewery byproducts, tons of different things, um, which we'll see on the next page. But and aiming for a carbon to nitrogen ratio for us of 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. So um, you're needing a lot of carbon. I'm gonna assume a lot of people know the basics of composting, but the carbon is basically, for us, leaves, wood chips, bedding, and the nitrogen is pretty, we have fish scraps, um, food scraps, manures, and um, that's there's probably other things I'm forgetting, but, um, keeping that balance in mind. So a lot more carbon to nitrogen. There's definitely charts you could look up online in the beginning to get a feel of what that looks like, um, the, you know, when you have your different inputs you're putting in there. But it is, after a while, becomes a bit of an art. You can tell by the texture when you're mixing it up. Um, microbes need water. This is one thing that's hard to regulate if you have open piles, which we do, but keeping the compost moist, but not saturated. So we're always aiming for 50% moisture content during the whole process of composting. 
it's a bit of a challenge, but it's a good goal to have. Um, so when it comes to your farm profiting, I can't talk enough about the value of compost. So I, like I said, our fields are just amazingly fertile right now. So this is one clove of garlic. I've been now saving garlic seed for 20 years and every year picking the best cloves and replanting those. And just where the crops we can grow are, are incredible because of amazing organic matter content, this soil life that's happening here. This is my son. He just pulled these carrots out. I don't really have to say anything. I mean, they, it speaks for the health of the soil alone. This was a sweet potato we grew last fall. It, I dug it up with a, a class of children, third graders, and it was six and a half pounds. It really just created a buzz in our community. I ended up donating it to the school for their auction. And the school, a bunch of parents pooled in together and bid $6,000 on the sweet potato and donated to a local food bank. I mean, that's like incredible profits. Um, and then this is a picture of my husband. He's six foot two with this, a, a bunch of our rhubarb, from a, our 40 year old rhubarb patch. Um, that it's just, you know, you're going to you're going to profit more from your crops being more robust. And I can't talk enough about the soil tilth. We had two years ago a severe drought here in Rhode Island in the summer. And our crops did great because your your composty laden soils are going to hold moisture so well. And then this past year, it was like we had one day with nine inches of rain and then a week later, five inches of rain. And it's almost it feels almost miraculous, but it's not. But there's science to it that um, the water could just drain into our fields because we're we don't till and we have the compost has all that porosity so the water can actually soak in like a sponge and be absorbed so you're going to create amazing resilience on your farm if you can add in a lot of compost so that's the main way it's helped us profit no there's so many ways but that's one second way is clearly with sales um, we produce 5,000 cubic yards of compost a year and we sell it all um, every batch especially the last few years uh, there's waiting lists for our compost. And we are more than twice as expensive as everybody around us for our price per yard because we're, we're, we have a lot more attention to detail. It's a very high quality product. And um, I, I promise you, if you spend the time on the quality, it will pay you back with what you can charge for the compost and you know your, your profit margin there. So it's well worth it. And the, the variation here is, we have $80 if you get this, you know, the straight compost by the yard in a truck, or it's $365 if you get some of our fancier blends. We have a, a cannabis growing blend that that's what that goes for. So it's all in between. Oops. Okay, so our next thing is the way it's helped, um, compost has helped us profit is through tipping income. And we're a little bit different. We have very reasonable uh, tipping structures because I'm really looking for, my, my income comes mostly from the compost, not from the tipping income. I'm looking for these resources to make a really good compost. So, and I, you saw 30 parts carbon to one part nitrogen. I need a lot of carbon sources. So I don't charge for, comp, for carbon. We're looking, we want leaves and wood chips, chipped brush. We take it that in for no fee, but it has to be 100% clean. And so people are saving, you know, businesses are saving money by bringing it here, but they have to be more careful because we're very careful about that. Um, we do charge for things that are harder to handle, like the um, gurry clam bellies offal, that's um, fish scraps. That stuff is very difficult to handle. It's got odors, you know, it comes in trucks and it smells when you dump it. So we do need to charge for that, but it's an amazing resource for our compost when mixed in properly. Um, seaweed, feet, which I know a lot of you don't have that in your areas, but it's a great resource. I promise you there's something in your area that is going to be as equally exciting as some of these resources that we get to have, um, food scraps. And my prices, I basically just did half of what the local landfill charges to encourage people to come here, but knowing that they get that benefit because it needs to be 100% clean. So in order to have our quality levels that we assure people, prevention is 100% the most important thing. 
um, we require every truck that comes in here to sign a tipping declaration form, basically saying that they understand we're growing food for organic production. There cannot be any contaminants, no glass, no metals, no plastics, no herbicides, no toxins at all. And they have to sign that. So that's step number one. Um, we actually have an extra precaution for hay and manure that was kind of addressed earlier why we need to do that. There's just those forever chemicals that should not be on the market, but unfortunately are. So if you're going to bring us manure um, or hay and manure, we need to know the source of the hay that those animals ate, how it was treated, um, and same with hay. So there's not a lot of that coming on, but we're fortunate in Rhode Island that those amino paralids are not allowed in Rhode Island. Um, and I would petition for states to just keep doing that state by state, banning those um, use of those terrible herbicides. Um, the third thing is to inspect each load visibly. Even after it's been signed, sometimes the truck driver doesn't know that there's some coffee cups in the back or something. And um, it only takes a, a one time of kind of a scolding, all right, this load is contaminated and, and we will actually take our tractor, load it back into the truck and they have to take it to the landfill. It's happened, it happens every, you know, so often a couple of times a year, maybe a plastic bag went through the wood chipper and you get bits of plastic in your chips. I'm not going to accept that. You're gonna to have to take that back. Um, and that really, um, that happens once to somebody and then they're much more careful about what's going on. So there's a few of us, we call it policing the loads and uh, we get to just check them visually. And then, um, when it rains, this is something to prevent problems, is make sure, I actually love to walk the site with my crew when it's raining to see how all the water is running off the piles. If we notice an area where water is pooling and creating anaerobic conditions around the bottom of the pile, we will quickly work to um, ameliorate that and, and make sure that we create a berm or swale so that that water flows properly away from the piles. Record keeping is key. Um, we have a meeting at the end of every day where we record any inputs that went into the compost. That's a daily thing. It's just a, a really simple Google um, form, Google Sheet. And um, that's for each batch of compost has its own sheet. Weekly, I take temperatures uh, and I take those in five spots of each batch to make sure we are, I'm very, very uh, careful to make sure we're getting those hot temperatures because I don't want any weed seeds in my finished compost, mostly for anybody but what a pain that would be to bring weed seed into your fields and i know that's a common mistake that composters make so um, we're just making sure we hit those hot temps over 131 degrees we've got it down to a science so i, I take the temps but i usually pretty confident they're going to be hot they are um, and then i do record let's see if i can pull this up it's being blocked um this is really small but um we we name we name each block of compost um, it's easier for me to talk about the the compost batch named felicia and when she's supposed to be ready making sure we can test her then when we start selling when we've turned the dates we've turned her um and then you can see taking the temperatures each week what we've recorded um and and then i have like special notes i can add in if i notice something oh there's extra fungi growing in that batch or um, great results and what do we do, you know? Um, so that's important to see. Um, okay, so marketing and selling compost. We do bag our compost and sell it at garden centers. We sell it in these bulk bags to farmers and landscapers. And then we also just, you can come and get a yard with your dump truck, pickup truck, trailer, or we can ship it out to a local distance. We have four different blends. We have our straight compost for boosting existing soil. Um, we have a blend of our compost with peat moss and minerals. It's a raised bed mix for directly planting into. These two are equally popular. We have a potting soil for potting plants up, which is great, great for house plants too. And then we have a cannabis growing blend. Um, I can't talk enough, oops, about knowing your costs um and your margins this is not something that i i i'm got like a farm background but i did study economics at school and um, my first year running the farm i met with my dad and the accountant and we said 
I said, what is the true cost of a yard of our compost? And we, at the time we were selling our compost for $60 a yard. And we each, all three of us did our own calculation. We had, we calculated in labor, our equipment, the permitting, insurance, all the things that we could think of. It was a long list of things that would go into making our compost. We all came up with about $50 a yard is what it truly cost us to make a yard of compost. And um, we were only selling at $60 a yard. And that is a very slim margin. Um, so I have been incrementally, uh, you know, increasing the cost, that what we charge for the compost now, it's up to 80 a yard, but um, we still have a, a kind of a slim profit margin. So if you could start off knowing your costs truly, I bet you'll have a leg up at setting the appropriate price. Um, and But you'll see our profit margin for bag compost and blends is very healthy. So that allows us to kind of, you know, in between we've got a healthy thing. You're, you wanna aim for 50% at least for your profit margin. So this is really key, really practical. Actually, it's really great to do for all your crops. Um, I like doing it for the rhubarb, the garlic. What does it truly cost you? Sometimes it's a little depressing. <laughs> Um, let's see here. So this is my last slide, but um, basically marketing methods, I always used to think marketing was like this kind of dirty word. We don't do like, we don't have an ad campaign or anything, but it's not. Um, I realized that marketing is just, what we were doing was growing beautiful produce. That's gonna be your best way of sales. Um, and then posting about that beautiful produce. I'm just on social media, very free. Um, it gets a lot of interest if you, you know, show that beautiful clove of garlic. Uh, classes is something we teach a lot of classes, not just on composting, but gardening. And we have mushroom walks. And this is a cooking class we did recently, cooking up sweet potato greens. Um, we do weekly videos. I highly encourage you to go to our YouTube channel because we have a compost production tour video that I think will be really helpful for those of you setting up a, a compost facility. Um, we give a lot of tours. I really, if you're going to be in Rhode Island, which I know is kind of uh, not even on the map for most people, but I would love to give you a tour. I give tours to preschoolers all the way up to retirement homes and in between, and um, I'm very passionate about the farm. I'd love to show you. And then our most effective method of marketing is truly word of mouth. When people have a great experience with our compost, adding that to their, their gardens, and for the first time they have a green thumb, they're going to talk about it. And for 40 years, we've just had this snowballing so um very exciting too i'm sure a lot of you with your farms are already doing all these things and you start talking about your compost and um if it's truly high quality you'll have no problem marketing it so um i think that is let's see if i can switch now <laughs> to my am i did i <laughs> Do you want to oh. show something else? Nope, I was trying to get off the share screen. <laughs> okay, that was a great presentation, Jane. Thank you so much. Uh, we do have a number of questions. Um, so I was wondering if you could say anything about the permits or licensing that you might need in Rhode Island to sell your compost. To sell the compost, yeah. Um, Again, I kind of touched a little bit. We were ahead of um, any of the permitting in the beginning. Um, that didn't start till the 90s. So um, we had a little bit of a leg up in that way. But in our state, you need to register if you sell any kind of soil amendment. Um, and then you have to list what's in it. And you have to make sure that your bag, if you have a bag, or your receipt, if it's bulk, list um, certain things, your name, your address. Pretty simple. And it's tough because each state is different. I don't think there's any Rhode Islanders on here, maybe one or two or something, but um, that is different. We are very fortunate in Rhode Island to have two different compost regulating bodies through our Division of Environmental Management. And one is agricultural composting. The other is, um, I forget what they call it, but the more con uh, commercial composting. And they, they do have different regulations and different um, I really like, I, I, we fit under the agricultural composting. We're a large scale agricultural composter. And um, the goal of that is to encourage farms to compost. So 
it's just a little bit different way it, rather than regulating, um, which it is regulating and it's making sure people are doing things right, but with the goal of making, you know, encouraging compost. So that's been really, really helpful. And I would encourage all states to have that for farms. Does that answer it? <laughs> yeah. yeah great. Uh, thank you. Um, some other questions folks have uh, revolve around managing your compost how so first question what type of machinery do you use to flip your compost and i'm sure that this is in the video that we will uh, make sure to share with folks yeah um, and we, we yeah sorry we just we flip we don't have a, a compost road turner because our piles are quite large for that um, and we find the slower methodical turning we end up with a better product at the end, just from our own experience here with our process. But we use a just a front end loader. It has um, a six yard bucket on the front. Um, and so we can kind of move mountains fairly quickly. But I do have two full time guys turning, uh, you know, most of the time turning or loading or doing something screening with the compost. Great. And how do you incorporate testing? or um, you, you gave a lot of information about how you manage the sort of the quality of your compost. And I'm wondering if, if you guys, how, how you go about testing. You know what, I skipped a slide, um, which I can just talk about, but we do um, test at three different labs. We send out for a biological um, analysis, not the same way that the last presenter was talking about, but. Um, to measure the microbial activity, microbes, fungi, all the in-betweens, um, so that kind of count. And then we send out to two labs. We we have been working with Logan Labs and ANL Labs to do that nutrient uh, readout. We then we are OMRI listed um, for organic farms, so there are uh, some additional tests. We have to make sure that there's no um, sal salmonella or um, I'm forgetting the other one. The two, the two bad ones that you want to make sure that there's not um, so there's additional testing for that um, and then we have um, a third thing that I just started doing once there was talk of those um, amino paralids those kind of forever herbicides uh, because it, it, it's I I've heard one tablespoon of that in an Olympic sized compost pile is enough to cause that phytotoxicity in plants that alarmed me so much that um, made me very, very leery. At first, I just stopped taking in any hay and manure. Um, and then now I've been doing it slowly with the assurances. But I take each batch and I grow pea shoots. Very simple. My family loves pea shoots. They're great microgreen. And um, pea shoots are one of those ones that are very, very um, sensitive to that herbicide. So if you were to grow them and there was a problem, they would be yellowed, the leaves would be curled, they would look not healthy. Um, fortunately, we haven't had any bad experiences with that, but I know plenty of composters that have had issues. But that's an easy way. You could grow pea shoot microgreens, test each batch, super easy, super simple. I looked into testing, but the test is owned by DuPont, who owns the chemical, super expensive to test for it. And you can just do it at home. Awesome. Could you expand a little bit more on the microbiological uh, assessment, uh, sure. the, maybe the lab that you work with? Yeah, we send out samples to Earthfort Lab, um, and they do a fungi to bacteria ratio analysis. They do a nematode count. Um, they're looking for uh, bacterial species counts, you know, how many species there are in a batch. And I, I have a microscope here and I love to look in on it, but it's a 400 times magnification. And so I, I can see the, for sure, I can see the nematodes and those microarthropods, and I can see that there's a lot of bacteria, but I can't actually tell the different bacteria species. So I like to have, also it's nice to have a third party testing it for you. Great. Um, some other sort of management questions. Uh, how long do you cure your compost? and do you ever need to add water to your piles? Yeah, so we have basically a six month cooking process and then a six month maturing process. Um, and if you can if you can afford to have that one year, you're gonna have a great compost. It, it seems excessive. I, I don't know any composter going quite that long. Sometimes we even go 18 months if needed, but um, the demand is so high, it's hard to do that right now. So, but six months is, seems to be nice. Um, 
And then what was the other part to that question? I already forgot. Um, uh, water. Water. Okay, so again, we're blessed in Rhode Island. Um, 50 inches of rain, basically we're getting an inch a week. So we haven't really had an issue with needing to add water. Sometimes the spring is challenging because we get too much and there's not a whole lot I can do about that. This year I've just put up some bays to keep, I can keep maybe a hundred yards dry, but um, that's our challenge is too much water. So I think if you're in an area that's droughty, I would really think about the materials coming in, if they could be a little wetter coming in or really design that that retention pond so you can pump that water back onto your piles would be helpful. Awesome. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions that um, that for both you and or Greg to answer, um, if, if either of you has an answer. There's a question, um, of someone who's participating uh, works with the, in a jurisdiction that has huge quantities of pine needles um, that are taken to their solid waste transfer stations. Uh, does anybody have any experience with pine needles and how does that affect the pH of the finished compost? I, I could speak to that and then I'm sure that you could too. Um, pine needles are amazing. They're a great texture. They break down really quickly and well in our system. Um, they are very acidic, um, but it, it seems like it doesn't, necessarily matter about the beginning stage those microorganisms are going to metabolize and they just naturally change the ph of things We're, we sometimes take in cranberry bog material which is extremely acidic and it, we still have like a 7.0 7.5 sometimes compost at the end so i would say don't worry about it it's great stuff great carbon jane was spot on i can't add anything to, to improve it <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, okay. Labs often recommend sending samples in sealed plastic bags, but could this anaerobic environment skew pH uh, results? Um, this person has an electrical conductivity and pH meter that they use, and they've noticed different results um, from what they get from the lab. Any comments on that? So, um, the the uh, made for home, made for farm implements, conductivity, pH can vary a lot in their quality. So it's it's going to depend on. I mean, you can certainly get those um, instruments to use at your home that will be good quality, but a lot of them uh, are all over the place in their results. Plus, there's no one method of measuring conductivity or pH. It depends on the volume and mass of the sample that you have, how much water you add, how long you stir it, are you placing the electrode deep into the mix or into the supernate and liquid? So I would guess that the bigger differences were due to the method of analysis that was used at home in the lab and not necessarily the changes that take place in the sample. Plus the sample you send, you send should not be extremely wet. I can understand if um, if you're taking a sample during the process and it still might, might be 55% moisture, but if it's the end of the process and it's 40%, 45% moisture, uh, it shouldn't uh, change in a day or two in a cool environment packed in a container with an ice pack. But it's it's possible if you're, if you've packed it and left it in the sun, and uh, and it's uh, it's uh, decomposing, it, it it can have a negative effect on the results measured in the lab. Um, I also find I, I make sure that I have a lot of air in that that bag, sending it in, um, so I feel a little bit better that it's not getting anaerobic in the in the bag. And I, again, I send to three different labs and I consistently get three different results for my pH. There are different testing methods and I swear, I, each 
little area of the pile is different, even though I'm doing a big composite and mixing it up, it's just going to be different at different labs. I'm not as concerned about the pH um, as I am about the life in that soil. Um, there's been so much research about how the life in that soil creates this environment around the rhizosphere of the roots to, to make the pH the, what it needs to be for that plant to succeed. If you have lots of different life, you're going to have uh, hedge your bets about what's needed for that root zone. So that's kind of, I just want to see lots of life that's going to be encouraging that it's going to support life. Yeah, I would support Jane's statement about the um, about how important or non-important pH is. Uh, certainly, you don't want to be using a very high pH material around your blueberries or your rhododendrons, and it's more important to know the pH for that use because it, it's a strong buffer and it can raise the pH. But in terms of the quality of the compost, you can have a wide variance in pH and still be just as just as high quality. Great. In a similar vein, there's a question about, so uh, this person is storing their compost without a cover out in the open. How is that likely to affect the results that they get from any compost quality or stability tests? So if in fact the material has been completely stabilized, it's gone through some curing, uh, then that uh, additional water should not, or moisture that might be percolating into the compost should not drastically affect many of the results. The, re the results would be more affected by um, by the external effects of moisture in the pile, uh, if you're taking a, a sample of a pile that's that's not completely composted, not mature, not stable, and so the anaerobic conditions under under within that condition, while the activity is still occurring, uh, would be more likely to to give. Um, different results, erroneous results, results that aren't easily um, interpreted. Uh, I would agree. And I would add too, um, it depends where your pile is. I, I see a lot of farms that they put their finished compost in this like swale, like it's like a bowl, and then it rains and the water's sitting in there pooling. That is, even if you have a great compost to start with, if you're leaving it in those conditions, it's going to revert to anaerobic conditions and not be great anymore. Um, you have to be constantly thinking about making sure there's oxygen for those microbes back to think like a microbe. So I would say cite it so the water's flowing off the piles, not saturating that compost. And even for us, sometimes it's time we, we still are flipping our mature compost to aerate that. So think about air. Yeah, it's it's way more important to move your pile under cover or under shelter when it's near the end of the act of processing and, and curing so that the heating process is, is no longer there to help uh, remove some of the moisture. So early on, when it's actively composting, shedding water, evaporating water, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be so worried about leaving it outside as uh, during the storage at the end and during curing. Great. And one final question uh, to kind of close things out. And it's a big question, so we'll see how far we can get. But what will it take for agriculture to be the top compost end market? Um, I could pick this up because this last year and a half, I've seen a huge turn with a lot of new um, no-till regenerative farms that are buying a lot of our compost and they're they tend to be smaller and I know this is different in different parts of the country New England has really expensive land and um, so the farms are getting smaller and smaller but we're selling a lot to fa to farms you know hundreds of yards to a farm um, even so that that's very exciting and encouraging to me I think we're trending in that direction yes the uh, the, the type of farms that um 
Jane is describing are definitely the kinds of farmers, the smaller uh, organic uh, high value produce farms are the kinds uh, that could afford to buy it. We're not going to see compost being used in our sort of uh, large scale, uh, what is often called industrial corn, wheat, soybean farms because of the um, the large, be, because largely the cost of the compost and the tight margins and that kind of farming. Got it. Okay. Well, I wish we could continue this conversation, but thank you both, uh, Greg and Jane, for great presentations, for joining us. And thank you all for joining us. Have a great rest of the day. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks. <laughs>